Hello, everybody. Welcome to another film, fellas. Um, Ed's joined us. Hello, Ed. Hey, how are you doing? So Ed's got this obscure movie. Um, I've never heard of it. And it has the hilarious um, title called Wind, which no doubt will cause some uh, double entendres of some kind as we go through this and, um, you know, various wind jokes. But Ed, you know, I'll stop talking. What's this film about? Right, so this is a film I watched for, I was probably 12, 13 years old. Um, so 1992 film directed by Carol Ballard, uh, starring Matthew Modine and Jennifer Grey, and a very young Stellan Starsgard. Um, it's it's basically about sailing, which th there's not many films about sailing. Um, there was It came in around the same sort of time as things like White Squall and... Uh, I'm trying to think of another one. That's probably the only one I can think of. Um, and for me, it was a sort of Saturday afternoon movie where you just kind of switch off. And and it was about sailing. And that and that was the whole thing for me. I mean, I, I sail in in my spare time when I when I can. Obviously, I don't live near the sea, but do my best. Um, and the film is just it's just kind of a warm Sunday afternoon sport epic really um and it was unlike anything that i'd seen before uh, i'd never seen footage of of sailing done the way it was done um and it's funny really i watched it recently again obviously subject to this and uh and it's it's definitely not as good as i remember it being <laughs> but, um, well well having having been sent it by you and um and watched it you know I think I can understand why it might not have been a hit. Yeah. It, you know, you and I both love the filmmaking process. And I think, yeah. it, you know, anybody watching who, who also loves the filmmaking process, I mean, tell us about, it, you know, some of the things that, that it basically almost kind of revolutionised with, with kind of seafaring kind of filming. Yeah, I mean, look... You've got two two massive problems on boats. They don't sit still, and it's wet. So those two two things were some of the biggest problems you could face as a filmmaker, I think. And and somehow Carol Ballard and his um, cinematographer, um, I think his name is John Toll. I think his name right. was. I might be wrong about that, but and he was. Um, you know, they, they between them, because uh, Carol Ballard was a cinematographer first before he was a director. Um, and he, I think he got his act, his directing chops on Black Stallion, I think was, was his right. first, first film. And, um, but he was a cinematographer first. So he was all about how it looked. Hmm. And like the thing you've got to remember about, uh, you know, these boats, like the, the America's Cup, which is what the film is based on, is is probably the most elite, elitist mm. thing, you, sport you can possibly do. Even now, uh, it's, you know, these boats are worth hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds, if not millions now. And and they're doing something that's actually really, really difficult. But they're also doing something that a very small group of people do. I mean, this isn't mm. like football. It's not like basketball. There isn't millions of kids out there going, I really want to be a, a yachtsman. Mm. It's 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 a very strange sport for for people to connect with and so i think what happened with this film was that they tried to bring it to the public and it nearly worked it nearly nearly worked but what it did was it showed off some cinematography that was had never been seen before mm -hmm. i was doing a bit of research into it and it, i mean it was the start of the kind of use of gimbals i think in right. a very basic level um but what they did do was they made use of what had previously been documented Terrian cameras so that mm. Aton 35 mil uh, which is a very compact camera mm. which allowed two cameramen to be on the boat which is not a big not, not a lot of space I mean they're quite large boats but you're talking kind of 40 odd footers so that there's not loads of space when you've got all mm. this crew running the boat so there was it allowed two cameramen to be on the boat all the time and they and they were just huddled up there with the cameras so, I mean, because there's been obviously in the making of Jaws, it's quite well known that there were quite a lot of difficulties filming at sea. And I think famously Spielberg wanted to 
mounted everything on tripods originally before yeah. everything you know was essentially handheld like you were saying yeah and essentially what they did here was that the the cinematographer and and, and carol ballard came up with this it's almost like a sawhorse you know like the mm. thing you you, you you do for diy uh, and they were and that was strapped to the deck and they were strapped to that and that right. that allowed them the freedom of movement without the risk of being thrown overboard all the time okay so, so well, well let's let's move on what's this film about ed because right, it's title well, win so let's let's put everybody out of their misery what's this film about I mean, ultimately, it's a classic sort of underdog story, if if you want to see it that way. So I think it's based around the 1983 America's Cup is basically the storyline. So America, who had historically won the America's Cup many, many, many times and, and had held it for a long time. This young, uh, young sailor comes on board and and he, he's working as a kind of. Not helmsman, a, a tactician. Mm. And whatever tactic he asks the skipper to do, it, it it results in them losing the America's Cup for the first time in God knows how long to Australia. Then he kind of goes off the map, as you would do. It's a bit of a kind of Top Gun type story. Mm. And then he decides he's going to win it back because what's better than winning the America's Cup? It's winning it back again. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so he... So he goes off and his girlfriend, who's also a sailor, but also a, a, a designer, marine designer or something, they they together, they, along with Stellan Skarsgård, who's a, who designs aeroplanes, they design this boat and they mm-hmm. design sails and they somehow get the money together and, and they, they, to put up against the australians in the next america's cup which is in yeah. two years two years hence from the day and we day. can all probably imagine what happens at the end but you know let's let's oh. leave people wondering so obviously you know this is a film I, and you've mentioned this film to me a couple of times and and how much you love it and enjoy it and we all have these kind of guilty pleasures of movies that not many people maybe have heard of or you know one of mine was state of grace which i knew yeah. you hadn't heard of and so Give us the three reasons, Ed. What's, what's your first reason why people should? Because they're going to have to really hunt this movie down, aren't they? I mean, this is something. They, they are. This is not easy to find. Yeah. I had to, to dig around the depths of the internet for this. Yeah. Um, so, what's yeah. your first reason for? What My you first know? reason, I think, is Carol Ballard. I think he's a. Uh, not great with the text, right? <laughs> with the language, is is. I think the script is, hammy in the extreme at times. But vis- as a visual storyteller, I think he's brilliant. And he he really knew what he wanted out of this. Mm. And um, he hadn't done a great deal before. Uh, you know, I think Black Beauty, Black Beauty, Black Stallion or whatever it was called, was the the only movie he'd done of note. And mm. honestly, after this, <laughs> he didn't do a lot more. Mm. Um, but what he proved, and I think it just comes from being a cinematographer, I think his skills as a cinematographer showed through here because visually the, the yacht racing is unparalleled as far as sport actions concerned. I mean, it's, if they shot that today, it would all be in, you know, huge tanks in Pinewood, you know, and this was out in the Bay in Australia and on, on the sound in wherever it is in America. And And obviously now I think if you shot it now, with the size of um, you know miniature cameras and and what they yeah. can record, at. you'd you'd be strapping cameras all over masts and various yeah. things, wouldn't you? And and this was you yeah. know shot late eighties, was it? It must have been. It was released in ninety two, so it must have been right. shot late. But it was a twelve week shoot. You know, I mean, they mm. went from you know Newport in America to to Australia mm. and over twelve weeks. With a huge stop in the middle in on the on the desert flats somewhere, and you know they have this film, and more of the film takes place on land than it does on water, ironically. Right. Um, and they do like to use the word wind a lot, uh, <laughs> and, um, but they, you know, it's great, and it's just, yeah, it's a film that he manages to do something that's really difficult. He makes sailing look really cool, and and just because I know, is it is it right that um, Coppola is one of the producers? He is, he's, yeah, he is one of the producers. So, do you think maybe at some point, maybe even Coppola considered directing this? Well, it's possible. I haven't been able to find anything to back that up, but it, but it did mm. strike me as, you know, when you think about Coppola's attention to detail, I feel like where it fails in the script, I think Coppola would have picked it up 
and, mm. and lifted it well above. I think it would have been a four hour film. Um, <laughs> it probably would have <laughs> been, uh, it, the action sequences would have probably not been as fast. I think for me that there was a sort of top gun element to this film. Yeah, You know, the, the action sequences were really well thought out, really well executed. And the pace of them is is really notable. And when you look at the the unfortunate pace of the land based stuff, uh, you, you know, suddenly you've got this this sort of like blur of activity, and you know, you really feel the pace of the the races. I mean, they're very compacted. It's like the actual races take place over weeks, and then. I mean, they... one thing I I really noticed of it was, and you know, the, the cinematography is wonderful. Even the land-based cinematography as well, everything's got a real kind of, I don't know, real depth and a real richness to it. It is a beautifully shot for the movie. It is, yeah. But it's, you know, it's a classic when you, you know, it's that thing where you have a cinematographer, mm. director, it's a bit like Terence Malick. Mm. You know, they're beautiful, beautiful films, but they rather get lost in themselves and never quite... <laughs> Never quite. Uh, yeah, see, I'll have to disagree with you because Thin Red Line is one of my favourite movies of all time. I absolutely do. But you're and, right. Uh, the, 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 it's it's very visual. Yeah. 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 And that and that's more important in, in some ways. And that tells more of the story for that film. Than... And, and I think Malik, you 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 buy into Malik's visual poetry. You, you yeah. know, his words essentially Will, will be functional, but it's all about the spaces in between the words with Malik, I think. Yes, I think that's yeah. true. And I think also he has a wonderful sense of score with the music. Mm. Which this film does not. It has right. that sort of awful 80s synth music running all the yeah. way through. Um, okay, so that's that's the first reason. Reason number two? I mean, Jennifer Grey, it's got to be. I mean, you know, she is every uh, 80s child's uh, <laughs> wet dream, really. I mean, and, and in this film, she's coquettish and cute and bubble, bouncy and spicy at times and, and beautiful and she has her part is kind of not really necessary to the whole thing mm. but she's a lovely addition so she has a bit of a tough time doesn't she because um you know she ultimately signs up to the crew and then through team politics he's told well, to kind of kick yeah. her off and, and things like that yeah team politics in general kind of is sort of Gen sexism, <laughs> general treat the sexism time. Yeah. yeah i mean yeah, it's yeah, just sexism your... at the time let's call it what it is at the time yeah, yeah. i mean and and sailing is one of the most elite sports mm. elitist sorry sports in the in the world and, you know it is predominantly white males that 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 sail right mm. and uh so for her to be featured in the film and in fact be kind of the hero of the film in many ways um because matthew modine's a bit of a drip in this as he is in a lot of things which is a bit sad coming off the back of um uh full metal jacket and then well, and where does this sit so this is just before then also um memphis bell as well will it be before memphis bell yeah just before memphis bell mm. um i think he did he did he did one other film between full metal jacket and this which right. i've never heard of and i can't remember the name of but um but yeah, you know, he he's he's one of those actors that I think's probably aged better than mm. you know, better now than he was then. Um and this film doesn't do anything for him particularly other other than that he's a very attractive man. But uh, I think I think you're right in the fact that the scenes that Jennifer Grey's in, she totally steals. Oh, completely. She yeah, she has that you know, watchability about her, not just because yeah. she's hot, but yeah. <laughs> you know, she's a damn good actress as well. And there are times when she is dragging this film. Mm. You know, the lamb based stuff would be considerably less interesting. I mean, Stellan Skarsgård, it was a bit of a throw up between the two because it was the first time I'd ever come across him before. And I think right. most people had come across him. This was one of his first American films. Mm. because Obviously, he wasn't from America. So it's, you know, it, it it's quite interesting to see him in that role because he's playing kind of like the... Um, the cat a bit like the character in Goodwill Hunting that he played, right? Okay, he's a bit like that. He's a mathematician. He's a, yeah. he's a designer, uh, and uh, so that was quite interesting to see as well. But yeah, Jennifer Grey's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, Stellan yeah. Skarsgård's one of those people. Like he's like Mads Mikkelsen, isn't he? He's, yeah. You could you could watch him paint a wall for the day. And Absolutely it'd be amazing. Yeah, he, and yeah, 
And, uh, you know, if Jennifer Grey, Matthew Modine, uh, Jennifer Grey, Stella Scarsdale, just roll over Matthew Modine mm. every chance they get, which, you know, I kind of like Matthew, but, it's, you know, it's a bit sad. But Well, kind of, Modine always plays this kind of almost Boy Scoutish, All American boy type thing. It, it, yeah. I, I, when I watched it, it almost felt that there was not much difference between his character's makeup here as in Memphis Bell as well. It, 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 you know, he comes yeah. across as this clean cut, all American guy. Absolutely. Uh, and that's exactly, you know, he, mm. you know, he's there in the yacht club and the suit and tie and everything else. And he's sort of playing a bit of a, a wild card in that, but still very much fitting into that that realm. So, yeah, this was not a stretch for him at all. Um, <laughs> but I but I thought Jennifer Grey particularly lifted the film uh, and it was always nice to see her on screen. So. Okay, so that's reasons one and two. What's what's your third and final reason? So my third and final reason that we should, shouldn't be a surprise is cinematography. Uh, I just think it is John. John Toll is the cinematographer um, who, who has gone on to film Breaking Bad. He's done... He had a hugely accomplished commercial career. This was his first feature film, right? Okay, and and when he when he took this on, it was the story goes that he was he was approached by Coppola and Ballard, and they talked about this film a year or so previous to filming it, and he thought uh, in I think it was an um, uh, 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 an example of the. Uh, American cinematographer, and apparently he was, he said, oh, God, I'm glad I don't have to do that. It sounds horrific, because not only with all the problems we've talked about, but he suffered terribly from seasickness. Right. So then a year or so went by, and he got a call from Ballard saying, I'm doing it. It's in Australia, and you're you're doing it with me. Hmm. I said, right, okay. And then and then they had to go ahead and work out how the hell they were going to do it. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so do you think the they they actually had to develop, you know, because you talk about um, various kind of shoots and 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 there has been occasions where certainly in Jim's James Cameron's kind of ballparks that he plays in, where he's had to invent equipment and, and find solutions. Do you think that was the case here, where they actually had to kind of invent kind of camera rigs, if you like? Absolutely. I think they, I mean, they had to contend with a lot of stuff. I mean, obviously there's the elements, but then, you know, they're working on boats. These aren't boats they had built for the shoot. These were genuine America's Cup boats. Right. So they are one of a kind often. And, and so they had to create equipment that allowed them to film seamlessly on these things for long periods of time. And probably and, screwing kind of various kind of camera rigs into the deck isn't an option. Yeah. yeah, basically, yeah. I mean, they, you know, they ha everything had to be within the tolerance of what they were dealing with. Mm. And then you look at the footage they got out of it, and you just think, how, you would think it was done purely on a gimbal, and actually, in reality, it was mostly on a shoulder. Yeah, and, and I, I think I think that's that's the thing. The overriding memory I have of it is that actually some of the shots are pretty damn special. Oh, I mean, this, there is no better sailing film mm. shot in 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 actuality. Rather not, I'm, you know, obviously there's impressive films where they've got pirate ships and everything else but i'm talking about a film that is shot in location mm. with sailing boats traveling at speed these things go 50 60 miles an hour yeah. going fast and you know they 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 are not small things um, no i know and and i guess the only other probably comparable kind of footage that you will get um on on sailing is probably from waterworld you know, because he's, yes. he's got a catamaran and, and it's going yeah. at pretty speed and it looks like all of that was pretty much done practically at the time. Yeah, I think that's probably quite accurate, actually. And, you know, I, I would bet good money that some of the skills that were done on wind mm. were later used on Waterworld. Obviously, more money. Um, probably equal sort of result <laughs> to, to the popularity. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. It's it's just one of those films that stayed with me for a long time. I mean, mm. I'm lucky enough to be able to go sailing. So I, when I do go sailing, I, I always think, you know, on, on the dumpy little boat that I go sailing on, it's not quite mm. the same as these beautiful things. But, you know, there is all, that's always stayed with me. And it just it was just a film that it just felt cool as a yeah as, as a as a thing. And I, you know, I love a sport biopic, and it is sort of a biopic. It's sort of based on real events and, and real people but in a very sort of 
Hollywood way. But for me, it was kind of the top gun of sailing. You know, yeah. That's the best way I can describe well, it. Well, I mean, you know, if you're if you're in love with sailing, you're a sailing fanatic, you know, you can't, you've got to go track this movie down then. It, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I think if you're, but I think, you know, above, above the actual sport itself, I think if you're a fan of, if you're a fan of cinematography, mm. I think this is a film to watch because there's some serious skill on display here, uh, you know, and it's, it, it, the, I mean, a lot of it's crap, but <laughs> but but the bits that aren't crap are still still stand up for me. I was really surprised because yeah. a lot of it felt very dated. Mm. And as soon as you were on the boats, I was like, oh no, that 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 could have been shot last week. You know, it's yeah, yeah. Got that look to it. So yeah. Cool. Well, thanks, Ed, for talking to us about wind. I don't think we've got any wind puns in there, so that's probably a good thing. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, thank you very much for coming on. Um, your chance to say goodbye to everybody. And, and uh, well, we're going to see you soon because you're joining us next week and we're going to talk Chris Nolan and Oppenheimer. Absolutely. Looking forward to seeing that. So, yeah, no, it's, thank you for having me. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Wicked. Thanks a lot, Ed. Catch you later. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.